working with it. Um, Thank you. Um, well, thank you for um, for the invitation. Um, today, my talk is mainly on the connections of these these uh, topics. So, uh, um, if uh, if time allows, I may mention some new results. But uh, lots of our uh, um, current research are based on these connections. Okay. So, I will start from the motivation. Um, well, actually, um, we are um, at least some of these um, um, motivations for this uh, this type of research. As you will see, how they involve a lot of them has involved with exponential functions, the analysis of exponential functions. For example, the explosive identification um, has to do with this uh, um, spectral uh, the anal uh, to analyze the spectrums of these chemicals. And the uh, induction motor uh, current has to do with detecting a very um, um, small sideband in the spectrum, uh, spectrum domain. Uh, usually uh, when the motors, of course these motors are these important motors, they uh, prefer to replace them before they, the, uh, pre uh, re uh, replace them before they break down. So if there's a little imbalance, Usually uh, can be detected from this uh, from the electric current because they create a little bit of imbalance, but because of the noise, because of um, all other uh, constraints, um, usually uh, usually they have a they have a in the frequency domain they have a very major peak, and then they have very mild, very very small sideband in the spectrum domain, and if one use a Fourier to analyze these uh, signals, it will require to measure for a long period of time for this high resolution. Okay, and uh, uh, MRI and, uh, and MR spectroscopy are also similar because uh, if one has to uh, currently, a uh, lots of the tools are based on uh, Fourier analysis. But uh, these, uh, as we will, we will see some example. Not for this example. I may show this example next week. Okay, so. Uh, because uh, these signals are de uh, have decay, so they have damping factors. So uh, there's some limit um, of these tools based on Fourier analysis. Because uh, with the damping um, factors, then you lose the symmet symmetri uh, symmetries. Uh, and also, uh, Fourier, uh, in order to obtain high resolution, that means there are some of the frequencies are very close to each other. Um, because Fourier usually analyze them on the grid, okay? Because you have these data, they convert it into this uh, um, frequency domain. And if, they, if it happens that your frequencies are not on the grid, then usually these, uh, that one will be absorbed by the nearby grid. They call this leakage, okay? And very often they need to be able to separate two nearby frequencies. Okay, so using Fourier, then you have the leakage, you have the damping factor, it will be difficult to tell uh, whether, um, how many frequencies are there. And usually they need this information to, um, to detect uh, the molecular structures of these, uh, uh, of these, uh, the object they're looking for. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, lifetime imaging, I will talk about a little bit later on because these are purely damp signal only the real part. And directions of rival, I will talk about this next week. So, um, okay, so, so the, okay, so these seems to be very different applications, but some of the bottleneck, bottleneck problems are the battle, bottleneck problems in exponential analysis. Okay, so that's why um, um, I want to point out some of the, um, the difficulties in these problems. 
I, I usually say that mathematics, one of the definitions of mathematics is a key which open, uh, one key which open many locks. Yes. So in your case, <laughs> there are many uh, yes, locks which you saw, be very but, different. but the key is more or less yes. the same, mathematics, that's um, what is interesting for yes, us. Yes, uh, I, I will, I will uh, present some of the examples, mm -hmm. because uh, I'm not an expert, and actually, or, I mean, my collaborators, from Antwerp, we're not experts in this domain. We usually collaborate with domain experts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they bring the difficulties. Usually the bottlenecks are, um, are, can be translated into some difficulties in exponential analysis. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're, yeah. So bo most of the uh, students uh, from my uh, seminar comes, they are interested in mathematical form. Yes, and, yes. Uh, explanation how, how they apply. Yes. Because uh, they believe into that. Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah, but it's interesting to see how yeah. these uh, yeah. mathematical bottlenecks yeah. are affecting these, uh, these yeah. problems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I first will start with uh, sparse interpolation. So now we have a polynomial, and uh, the degree is 100. So if we use the conventional Newton or Lagrange interpolation uh, algorithms, we will need at least one or one samples, okay? Because you need to reach the degree. But actually, um, the okay. So in that case, you ignore the structures of the polynomial because actually, in this polynomial, many of the coefficients are zeros, okay? So if you, if you look from the sparse perspective, there are only four parameters that we need to locate. We have four. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four. Okay, what are these fours? We have to determine yeah, yeah, yeah. which two are non-zero terms. In this case, it's the constant term and the degree, uh, the, the monomial terms of degree 100. And then, if we can determine which two terms are non-zero, then we can uh, compute the coefficients um, of these terms. Okay. Of course, in this case, we still know the number of terms is two, okay? But if we don't know the number of terms, then we can also uh, regard that we have one more parameters. We need to detect the number of non-zero terms and, uh, uh, and then also a four, two times the number of non-zero terms in this case, okay? So if, suppose we know that there are only two, non, uh, two non-zero terms, so we actually need to locate four parameters in this models. So how do we recover these uh, four, or compute these four parameters from four samples? Okay. So in general, for the polynomial case, um, when we consider a sparse interpolation algorithms, we usually, uh, we usually consider the case that the number of non-zero terms is far less than possible number. Of the, uh, of the terms in the model, okay? In the, for the polynomial case, um, all the exponents are integers, or well, actually positive, non-negative integers. But um, these polynomials, you can also carry this a little bit. They are very similar to cosine and sine, okay? So actually what we're going to deal with is a more general formulation in terms of exponential functions, okay? So um, you may imagine, you see here, we have um, five. So this, this five will be like the exponent, the, the non-zero exponent, okay? And the alphas are the coefficients, okay? The coefficients, and, um, and uh, we also, in this case, we also relax the exponents a little bit. Now the exponents, are not necessarily non-negative um, non integers. They are complex numbers, okay? And the coefficients can be complex numbers as well, okay? So in my next slide, I will show you how to recover these alphas and phi's from the samples of equally spaced points. So this is the, um, okay, so Actually, it's not this slide, the next slide. Okay, so um, 
we want to get some of this, I want to get this problem statement a little bit more um, precise. So now we're thinking of um, a function phi, and uh, we wanted to recover alphas and the phi's, phi i's, alpha i's and phi i's. These are the parameters we try to um, obtain from the samples, and very often um, these uh, measurements also come with arrows. So we have epsilon, side, uh, epsilon terms here, which we didn't have in the previous slide. And uh, alpha i's can be um, complex. Um, actually, uh, very often, I didn't write it down, very often we write alpha i as r times, we write it as r times, uh, sorry. Um, write as R like this. Okay? This is amplitude, this is phase. But they are fixed with each term. Okay? And uh, now our, there are two parts in our phi eyes. The real part and the imaginary part. Okay? So the real part uh, is, uh, is the usually we call it damping factor. Okay, because uh, if the real part is negative, then it, it, it decreases. Okay, it's a decay, and uh, the gamma usually uh, gives you the uh, provides this uh, periodicity in the signals. Okay, and here I also wrote down that the, we also we bound the. Um, the, the imaginary parts here. Why? Because if we sample these signals, we have to be very careful because the periodic part may have, if you try to, if we from the values of this, uh, um, from the exponent, for exponential parts, if we try to um, recover the exponent, um, we may have multiple solutions for periodic, um, uh, periodic uh, signals. So um, I'm going to show that in the, in the next slide. So lots of the challenges are related to this wide spectrum. That means usually we consider n is very large, but we are only look for very few n here. Very few terms, they could be anywhere. And uh, high resolution means um, these uh, frequencies um, can be very close to each other, okay? Because the standard tool is Fourier, but Fourier only can only uh, recover them on the grid, okay? And uh, SMR means the, uh, the 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 noise, the relative noise. Okay. Can you talk a little bit you? Sure. So from the Fourier um, coefficient, you mean the alpha i? Right? Yes. And also, do you consider your function phi in a, as an unbounded domain, or it's kind of like a limited in a very Yeah, good way? question. Uh, usually, um, now I gave you, I, I provide a very general problem statement. Right. In different applications, usually uh, there are some uh, additional constraints. But uh, you will see, if you have an imaginary part, then you need a bound. In, okay. That's why why you need a, a bound when you have an imaginary part. This is cosine three uh, theta and cosine theta. Okay, so um, if you look here, we need to sample at least twice of the opti I mean of the bound upper bound to recover uh, the imaginary part uniquely. So in this case, if you only sample at five points, I cannot tell these two apart. Okay, I have cosine three theta and cosine theta. So I need to sample dense enough. Okay, in signal processing, this is called Shannon Nyquist sampling rate. Okay, so you need to know an upper bound, as you said. If you have an imaginary part in exponent, you need to know the upper bound, and then um, uh, the samples, the distance between the samples has to be small enough, or the sampling rate needs to be high enough to guarantee the, the unique recovery within this range. But of course, for the real number, we don't have this problem. Okay? So that's how we solve the problem. Actually, uh, 
This algorithm was first um, presented by um, Prony in 1795 during the French Revolution. Okay. He was a French noble. So he wrote the paper um, computing the evaporation of the alcohol, okay? exponential models. And what, how did he do this problem? So Prony's problems requires to know the number of terms here, in this case n, n is known, okay? And, but we, do, we know uh, this function is an exponential function of n terms, and we sample this exponential function at evenly spaced point. So if you sample exponential function at evenly spaced point, you have, this is, this is, these are your, your samples, okay? And uh, how many unknowns in this model? If we know n, then we have two known, uh, two, I'm sorry, two n unknowns. Because we need to know n alphas, and we need to know n phi's, right? And now, these x, s are, are sampled at the delta, so these are just um, evenly spaced point. And the, and, the, and the interval between the sampling point um, is delta, okay? So this, we have two n samples, okay? Before I continue, because this is so easy, so I want to show you in this slide. Now we consider a polynomial. Very often this is called prony polynomial. So let's pretend we know, okay, so when we sample um, the target function at multiples of delta, we're actually powering this, right? We're actually powering this, because you see we're powering this capital phi, okay? And what is capital phi? The capital phi are actually the exponential functions that we're looking for, evaluated at delta, okay? Because in the following, we just, we just power this value, right? So if we know this capital phi, are, we're almost there, okay? Where you yeah, but we don't do but we don't use Fourier. Okay? But if once we know that, yes, okay, you can imagine because in Fourier you, you um, um, these are the using Fourier, these are in the fixed place. Okay? So these now we we, we don't restrict this little phi. So these little phi's can be everywhere. Okay? So so these capital phi's remember. So it transpose van der matrix, right? Yes, once you, once you recover capital phi's, then the alphas are easy, we can show that, okay? But let's see how we recover capital phi's. We look at this polynomial. So suppose now we construct a polynomial, and you see the way we construct the polynomials. All the capital phi's are the root of this polynomial, okay? So uh, because we have n roots, Okay, so this polynomial degree is n, and the coefficients are written like this. Okay, so this is easy. Um, I mean, you, you can keep the slide. See, if I rearrange the terms, so if I rearrange them using alpha, alpha is from the original um, exponential functions, and uh, you see this part is the Prony polynomial. Okay, so if I write the and I recollect them, okay, because you see this second part, okay, is actually this. Because I plug in, I simply plug in one of the roots here. So this is zero, right? If I rearrange this, I have this. Okay, so now I can actually go back to the original sampling values, the samples, okay? Because I do not know uh, capital fines at this point. But because of the rearrange, uh, re uh, because of the rearrangement, I can connect my samples to D, DJs. And what are DJs? DJs are the coefficients in the Prony polynomial. 
And if I have DJs, I have the prony polynomial, then I can solve the root. For the, and the roots will give me the values in exponential functions. Okay? So you see from this previous page, this is a linear recurrence relations because you can actually move s. Okay? And the length of this linear recurrence relations is the degree of this of this prony polynomial. So we can write this recurrence relation to a Hunkel system. Okay? And if you look carefully, we only need, because we come from F0 to F2n minus 1. So if, if we have 2n samples, then we can form this Hunkel system. If we solve this Hunkel system, then we have obtained the d's. And these d's are the coefficients of this polynomial. And then if we, do, we can, if we find all the n roots of this polynomial, we find, we, uh, we recover all the exponentials in our target polynomial. Um, okay, so this is Hankel matrix. Okay, you probably have learned that already. And uh, I want to bring, uh, because this talk is more about connection. We will show more connections later on, but I want to this. The same polynomial is called Hagmar polynomial from approximation theory. Okay, the formula looks like the top one is the determinant of uh, the values on the top and they put this uh, uh, monomial terms at the last uh, row. And then they divide by this. This can be found from the textbook of uh, approximation theory. And uh, I also want to bring this up. Is, uh, this is also related to formally orthogonal polynomial. So from Henrich's um, uh, textbook, uh, the same, this is, this is our prony polynomial. It looks like this, okay? And uh, so actually, the, so actually the, the top is the prony polynomial. But this problem, so now, uh, it, how do we solve this, uh, all these exponentials, evaluate at delta? So we, we solve a Hunkel system and we do root finding, okay? But the same problem can be reformulated as a generalized eigenvalue problem. Okay, so if you form um, this, the definition of h top zero looks like this. The r is the starting point of your Hankel system. Okay, so um, because our Hankel system is not just Hankel's. It's not just structured as a Hankel, um, Hankel system. Each of the entries, each of the entries, are um, comes from and the evaluation of um, of an, of an uh, exponential function. So it's highly structured. So actually, each of the Hankel system can be factorized as the one in the top, Vandermont times the diagonal and the transpose of Vandermont. Okay, and the and the nodes of this Vandermark are the exponentials evaluated at delta. Okay, so if we have if we just shift by one, then we can extract one more factor. So um, so the same problem as I just stated, solve a Hunkel, uh, Hunkel system and do root finding can be combined into a single step uh, by solving a generalized eigenvalue problem. And numerically, this is preferred, okay? Because a self Hankel system is not very, I mean, it's not very, it's often ill-conditioned, and root finding is also bad, okay? And once we uh, are able to recover all this capital phi's, of course, the next, uh, next step will be to uh, recover the exponent, as I stated earlier. So, 
um, the real part is that you recover the real part is easier, okay? But the imaginary part uh, is, uh, um, is a little bit more tricky. So as I just explained earlier, we need to follow the Shannon IQ sampling rate, okay? Um, but actually, um, I'm not going to mention the talk today. We use some tricks, uh, some tricks from um, combine some symbolic tricks. We're able to break this, uh, this, um, this sampling rate. So we can recover them uniquely uh, from, uh, from the sample that sampled at the lower sampling rate. OK, so once these, um, um, these uh, capital fives are recovered, the f alphas are, we, we just simply solve a vendor mount system, okay? And uh, if there's no noise involved, uh, they are determined because it's a, uh, I mean, these uh, alphas are fixed. But of course, if we have some noise, then very often we use least squared method, uh, a least squared method to recover alphas. Okay, so earlier, I, said, I, I, I talked about the uh, uh, number of terms, okay? So this is well known. If we have a Hankel system and each uh, entries uh, are the samples of an exponential function, of an exponential function, then we just started to, uh, to construct the uh, Hankel system if we exceed, if the dimension exceeds the number of terms, as we saw that earlier, these values, uh, there's, a, it's a, there's a linear recurrence relation among these values, okay? Which means if the dimension exceeds the number of terms, the determinant is zero, so it's singular, okay? And it's not singular. If you ha if you, the dimension is exactly n n by n, okay. The question is, what about if I don't know n? Um, how about before before I reach n? Can I just check um, the singularity up to the point when I reach um, a singular system? Then I say yes, I got n. Um, so. We prove that is with high probability. Okay, so most of the time, so okay, let me just put it in a plain language. Most of the time, you don't encounter a singular system, but it can happen if you're unlucky. Okay, so of course, uh, I'm not going to talk, discuss too much about this. This problem is very clear when you deal with a matrix uh, in exact arithmetic, but numerically, if it's non-singular, what do you mean by non-singular numerically? Because it can be very close to singular, uh, it's very, uh, very close to sing uh, very, well, it can be very highly ill-conditioned matrix, can, can be viewed as a singular matrix as well, so how does, it, um, how does it involve? We'll see that later on. Okay, so now I'll move to exponential mass. I, we first look at the example here. So in this example, we have four terms, okay? And as you see that the, um, the imaginary part goes to 45. So we take a bound of 50 here, okay? Now, so the sampling rate, so the sampling rate follows the Shannon Acoust rate, and there are four terms. If we look at SVD, because that's the way we look at the singularities in the, in the floating point environment, you can see clearly there are four terms. And then it drops to the ma machine zero. Okay? This is another example. So now we, these are is a is an exponential function with two terms, only decays. Okay? So we have two decay functions. And the goal is to separate them. To tell them, and yes, you can see this is a highly ill condition. Okay, and we also have noise. The noise is 34 dB. Okay, so some of you may not be familiar with 34 dB, so we write down the formula. Okay, that means um, it's 
about one over a thousand relative error. Okay, so you see the individual components. You can see two components and the noise. But if we look at the SVD, you only see one term. Now, okay. So now, if you have SVD, if you look at the SVD, how many terms are in this exponential function? Some people will say one, and maybe the second one is slightly larger, but it's difficult to decide, right? So now we go to approximation theory. Okay, so the same exponential function, let's pretend that we're considering an expansion, f, f of z. Okay, it's like Taylor expansion, an expansion. The coefficients are fj's. And fj's are the evaluation of an exponential function, of an exponential function, as we discussed earlier. Okay, so um, so now we have this f as an exp ex expansion. Um, if we use Padé approximation to approximate this expansion, that means you are trying to approximate this expansion using a rational function, okay? So if we usually, very often, we fix the degree of the numerator and the denominator, because we want to, okay, now this without error, we, if we want to cancel all the higher, I mean, lower degree terms, this is what you write, okay? So, so usually in a, 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 in a Padé approximation, we'll try to solve uh, these P's and Q's. Okay, I just gave you the idea. We don't have to get into the detail. So in order to compute the P's and Q's, we need to uh, recover the coefficients in the P's and Q's, in the P and Q's. And that's how you compute these coefficients. So you compute those um, A and B. So usually first, you solve B from the second part. Once you get your B's, you recover your A's. The B's uh, will be used to determine the coefficients in the denominator. Okay. Now, before we continue, you see the second system. It's a Hankel system. Okay, it's a Hankel system. And if you pay attention to this part, this this system, it looks very familiar. That's what we solved earlier for our Prony polynomial. Remember? In a Prony polynomial, we have a, at first we solve a Hankel system, then we do root finding. Remember? And uh, usually we solve, and so we try to recover, earlier we recover the coefficient of this Prony polynomial by solving this vendor, I mean, I'm sorry, Hankel system. And then, then we do we rec uh, then we compute the roots of this polynomial. So, so what we actually compute from this system, okay? Is exactly what we did earlier on the top. Okay, so then the next question is, from solving, uh, from using the Prony's method, I interpolate an exponential functions. So usually from this exponential functions, I recover several exponentials evaluated at the delta. That's what we did earlier. So who are these uh, exponentials that I computed? So actually, um, if you write the expansion, if you, uh, if you expand, uh, write expansion as a fraction, the fractional decomposition, these are actually the poles of this, um, of this expression. Okay, so let me just reformulate. So Padé approximation is trying to, the goal of Padé approximation is to use 
a rational um, function to approximate this expansion. Okay? In the univariate case, you can you have a pade approx uh, approximate, which is a rational function, then you can break them down, right? As a like these functions. These are fractional decomposition, right? And the so what we actually compute are the poles of this uh, Padet approximation. Okay, so once we recover the poles, we go back to compute the coefficients, which are the um, which are the numerators of this Padet approximation. Okay. And uh, okay, if you look, if you Google Padet Laplace transform, there's a lot of literatures on this. So, so what we did earlier, okay, we look at the simple case. Of course, there are also cases of poles of multiplicity. I'm not going to get into this because I only want to show the connection here. So, if the number of poles is n, the degree of the denominator is n because you have n poles, right? So, n root of this uh, polynomials in the denominator. And the degree of your numerator is n minus 1. So what we compute is the degree n and n minus 1, which is the numerator, and the n is the degree denominator. <coughs> okay? And so what we, so, um, so here uh, you see the q can be, com can be viewed. So what we compute is an inverse of, uh, so, okay, so the B here, actually, I skipped a little bit. So the way we formulate the B is actually the inverse of the Prony polynomial, but you just reverse them. It's not a problem, okay? So, okay, so by computing these, um, just go here, sorry. So this system, from this system, because you see the, your partition is kind of, kind of flip a little bit. Okay, so um, we compute. So actually, the Prony's method is equivalent to compute the poles of a Padet uh, approximation. Okay, so now we go to the Padet table. Okay, so. Um, because when you try to use a Padet, I mean a rational function, you do the Padet table, then usually in the case that we look in this slide, usually there's, there's a table because you have uh, in one direction is the numerator, one direction is the degree of the denominator. Okay? So imagine if you use Padet approximation to approximate a rational function, okay? Just this is like um, if your object is a rational function itself. Now we don't have any error involved. Once you hit the correct degrees in the numerator and denominator, the interpolant remains the same. Okay, so that's the Padet table. Okay, so once you hit the correct numerator and denominator, this part, the whole block. Uh, will not be changed. This is like you do uh, polynomial interpolation. Once, if you use polynomial interpolation to interpolate a data from polynomials, from a polynomial, then uh, if it's without any error, if there's no error involved, once you hit the direct degree, correct degree, then your interpolant remains the same. The same with Padet approximation. Okay, so of course, this is only the ideal case. So normally, we will have a little bit of error. Okay. So what will happen? Um, what happens to this table when you, uh, when my, um, so now it does these f are exact values of the exponential function. What will happen if there's a little error above? Okay. So if your measurement, your f, um, it's not 
the true exact evaluation of the exponential, um, of the exponential function. Um, and you continue with the Pade table, okay, the degree will continue to increase. It's like polynomial interpolation. If your target, target uh, value comes from the evaluation of a polynomial plus error, plus some error, or some, I'm sorry, plus some noise, then when you increase the degree, the degree will continue to be increased, right? So this Pade, so this block uh, will not remain the same. So the degree will increase. But, uh, but if you move along this line, that the numerator and the denominator will both increase by one each time, okay? And there's, uh, and thankfully, there are very nice results, in theoretical results from Nota and uh, Pemarenko, published in the 70s. So if you increase along this direction, each time you increase the polynomial, I, I said in, the degree of polynomials in the numerator and denominator. So each time you come in as a pair. These pairs are called facade duplets. Okay. On, the, on the unit circle, I'm not going to talk about the results. They come in pairs because, and they are very close to each other because they almost cancel each other, but they could not. Because imagine if it's without any air and noise, these, uh, these two uh, factors will not be there anymore, will not be there. So they, they appear as a pair, and they almost, they, can, they almost cancel each other, but could not. And, uh, and they usually appear on the, on the little ring of the inner circle. Okay, so actually what we do, and they, have a, and they are not stable, they can move everywhere. So based on these properties, we're able to separate the true poles and these uh, poles are introduced by the noise from the facade duplet. So now, okay, so what is a noise-free um, scenario, we want to de determine n, the number of terms, okay? We usually look at SVD because when, once we hit correct n, this is machine zero, okay? And based on the, uh, the, the approximation theory, property, convergence property, um, with noise, okay, I'm going to show you the, the picture. Okay. So look, look at this one. This is slightly different from the previous one. If you know, if you, um, so now, I sample at the Shannon Equist rate. But I put uniform random noise there. If you pay attention, these two image, okay, these are depth signals so because they have real parts. They have all have re a real part. And you, if you look at the imaginary part, these two are quite close to each other. These two are close to each other. So if I look at the SVD from um, uh, Hankel system of six, which means is 11 samples, this is what I see. Because I have two clusters, okay? But if I look at 50 by 50 Hanko system, I can separate these two apart. And this is based on the knowledge of those uh, Nota uh, Pomeranka theorem. I'm sorry? These are a singular value. So I rank the singular value. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if I only do, I look at the singular value of a, a 6 by 6 Hankel system. Because early I show that uh, we try to determine uh, the number of terms by looking at the rank. Okay? Uh, because in this case, we have two that are close to each other, another two are close to each other in the imaginary part. Right? And also, we have noise. So if you look at the 6 by 6 Hankel system, you have two clusters. So actually, these two terms correspond to two clusters. Mm -hmm. But based on what we, I stated earlier, uh, 
if we increase the then I look at the singular value of a 50 by 50 Hunkel system, I am able to separate these four um, uh, components apart. Okay? And we revisit the previous example. Okay, so the previous, uh, this is, uh, this is two, this is decayed, so which means they have no imaginary part. Okay, so earlier, this is what we saw earlier. If I increase the dimension, the second one pops up. Yes. So the x s, the the values are they are, not, the, they are the similar values. Or uh, these the, the red light. circles. No, no. Um, in a, so. You are calculating each summation on a singular value? I, yeah. I form a Hankel system. Oh, no, no. What are the x's? Okay. X's are question. the evaluations of my uh, function. So you I are taking 255 sample points. Is that correct? No, no. Um, that's, OK. This formula is used to uh, compute the error the relative size of error. Right. So for this, I only compute, this is to maybe, okay, 40. So I have 79 samples. It's a Hankel system. And each of this uh, Hankel system are composed by the evaluations of maybe like this, like this. And this is okay. So, okay. I wanted to point out is um, um, because we know this property from the facade duplet. Um, You see this, uh, okay, first of all, there are two conclusions. Actually, there are two tricks that we're using to, to solve certain type of problems. Number one is because uh, the convergence property pops out when you continue with that table. That's what I showed earlier, right? And second, uh, we, when we uh, very often, so people, when, we, they de when many people deal with uh, the problem with uh, noise, they use these square methods a least square method because they try to average the noise. So um, we also provide an alternative approach is we instead of consider a simple method, I mean simple model using a least square method to average the noise, we create a more complicated model. In this case, we have uh, 40 terms, okay? And then the additional terms are used to absorb the noise. The noise. And because we have a way to separate the true terms from the bogus terms introduced by the noise, so um, the true models, I mean, in some applications, the true models actually more accurate than you use a e square method. Okay, I'm going to, the last one, I just wanted to give you the connection of a tensor decomposition, okay? So, we look at the symmetric tensor. So what is tensor? It's a um, higher dimensional array, okay? Two dimensional array is a matrix, okay? So if it's higher dimensional, that means you have more indices because you can imagine three dimensional, but if it's more than three dimensional, then you just imagine that index has a, is higher dimension, okay? So symmetric tensor means um, they're symmetric. So which means, if um, um, if the sum of the indices is the same, then all these values are the same. Okay, these matrix, uh, these I'm sorry, these tensors appear in certain applications. Okay, for example, functional uh, MRI. I'm sorry, directional uh, MRI. So that's the tensor. Okay, so now because I can only write two dimensional arrays, so I, I'm dealing with a two. Uh, three-dimensional one, so I write them in two matrix. Actually, it's one after the other, okay? So now we look, if we try to re-express the tensor as a polynomial, so now we use uh, Z0 and Z1 to record 
um, the the indices. Okay, so we we can write this tensor in this form, and actually these values will be all the same. This is the same. These three are all the same. Okay, and they're all from this tensor. Okay. So earlier, I have two parameters, I mean two variables. I write it comp a little bit more com compact. Only co I only compute the total degree. I can write them like this. Okay. It's the same thing, huh? This this is the same thing. I just write it in a compact manner. And if I let z zero to be one. Okay, if I write like in this compact manner, this is a homogeneous polynomial. The degree are all three, right? If I let z0 to be 1, then you have degree from 0, which is constant term, to 3 here. So the problem statement, because I just wanted to skip a little bit, the problem statement of a, to decompose um, a symmetric tensor can be written as the following. So if you have this form, okay, because now this one can be obtained by the tensor that you're given. What we're looking for is R, W, and lambda. Okay? So we want to know, um, okay, and the uh, I go up, C's are directly from the original tensor, right? So C's are given in a way. What we're looking for is R, W, and lambda. Okay, and from C's, so how do we get from here to here? Because K and S are known, because these are the degrees. What's we, R here? This is not R, it's R, okay. You mean here? Yeah. Number of terms. That's that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. That's the order we're looking for in this tensor. Because when they do tensor decomposition, they want to know how many how many components that they can uh, uh, that they can decompose to. So the R is something that we're looking for. Okay? And the C's are directly from the tensor. And K's are just uh, compute based on, we compute it based on the knowledge because of the expression, okay? So from C's, we can get, obtain gammas here. And what are gamma? Gamma is actually a sum of exponentials in terms of lambdas now, okay? So this looks very familiar now, it's just, this is almost um, so this object is what we have discussed so far, right? Yeah. So how do we come? How do we obtain R? Okay. So this is the tensor. For example, that we do an example from here, we can form this polynomial, and from all the C's, we can form gammas here. Okay. And how do we determine R? We look at the sing uh, We look at the singularity of the Hankel matrix. So we know R is 2. So which means we can write um, this in terms of this. Okay? And uh, omega, okay, W and lambdas are computed based on um, solving this uh, Prony polynomial or Hadamard polynomial that we have computed earlier. So once we have those uh, lambdas, in this case it's 3 and 1 third, we can compute the coefficients, which are w in this form, right? So in this case, this is a very simple case, then we um, decompose um, them like this, okay? And uh, I think I'm going to finish here, okay? So these are the references from the talk, thank you. Yes. I 
so the R, uh, so R is the, 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 the rank of the tensor? Yes. Can I say that? Yes, in this case, yes, rank. Yes. And of course, uh, the, mo uh, the example that we use is just um, it's a very trivial example. So, of course, what I said up earlier about this approximation properties, uh, convergence property from Pade approximation, can be borrowed. Yeah, so, so I want to make sure that can, can this R be controlled by us? Like we impose like, like, like R equal to 5 and uh, com compute the decomposition? Yes and no. In some cases, they want to deter uh, determine R. Sometimes they, R is given. You, have to, you just need to decompose them into uh, different, different components. And the R is supposed to be uh, much smaller than, than K. Correct. Yeah, because as you, yeah, as you OK, of course, uh, we, re, uh, we, we, we reformulate several steps. Step. In order to detect R, you need to have a, a Hankel system that is larger than, uh, where the dimension is larger than R, right? So uh, you really need you, that, correct. So you need to move, you need more values if R is larger. Yes? So you used the pattern approximation because you had uh, singularities, is that correct? Um, the reason? Okay, so we have, Okay, so from earlier, um, I'm not sure what I do it correctly. So in the exact arithmetic, if there's no error, I mean no noise involved or no rounding error, okay, even without noise, the um, the rank of Hankel system is very clear. And earlier I just stated the rank of this Hankel system has to do with the number of components, the exponentials in the function. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you use, um, of course, numerically, how do you determine the rank of a Hankel system? You, then you look at singular values. And I just show the two examples that you will get into trouble by looking at singular values because they can be ill-conditioned or with noise. I mean, could, so, uh, but if our uh, samples are from, um, an exponential function, or you know that the, they follow the model of an exponential function, uh, plus some noise. From the Pade approximation, we know that they have some properties that the, uh, we know there are some properties that we can borrow. Yeah, so these are, there are some convergence, because, uh, because if the object itself is a rational, I mean, sorry, it's an exponential function, it can be equivalent to, we're using a Pade table to approximate a rational function plus noise because the poles of this um, a Pate approximate um, are, um, are the components of the exponential function. I'm sorry, I sure. still have a question. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, about the right. So, so, so for, for the applications, uh, how, how small uh, is uh, in R it be compared to K? Uh, okay, so. Okay, so the R. Okay, so of course, uh, the R. Now, if we talk about exact case. Okay, so now we need. Uh, uh, a three by three Hankel to detect R. But if you know R in advance, which is two, you only need the two by two, right? So, 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 so uh, are there uh, uh, like real applications where, uh, where the, the rank is only, uh, where the rank is only R, uh, is only two? Uh. Um, okay, so, okay, that's a good question. Okay, so there are applications from the paper yeah. that the, uh, People are writing because uh, these uh, these conditions uh, can be um, interpreted as uh, this. Um, uh, they have this uh, kind of this uh, 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 functional MRI. It's like in each voxel, they try to determine a direction. So there are not many directions. They just try to determine the the main direction. So there are not many R's. But so this is one of the. Um, of the applications appear on the paper. But the, I know that in functional MRI, people are not really using this because this is still very algebraic. 
Okay, they are still uh, just trying to measure everything. But mathematically, um, that's the problem they are, they are solving. So I know that people working on this type of problem are trying to use this because 